Hello and welcome to day 39 of our Lent 102 series. Today's topic is Good Friday. So getting right into it, Good Friday. Good Friday is one of the most significant days in the Christian calendar because this is the day that Jesus is crucified. So everything that we've heard up and from the beginning in Genesis say that there's a Messiah coming. So all the generations before Jesus have come to this very moment and that is for God to accomplish that what God has set out to do and that was to atone for our sins. So, let me give you a brief understanding of the moments that happened just up until the moment Jesus was crucified. So as you might have learned from our last uh, two episodes where we had part one and part two of Jesus's journey, when he was going around teaching people and he was going around doing these last few acts, having a last supper and have these last few acts of what he wanted to do just before um, the crucifixion, um, there was one thing that stood out, right? And it's about Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, who um, he said that is going to deny Jesus three times. Let's read what happens. In the uh, book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 70, it reads, But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. So these are people saying that um, Jesus now has been appreh apprehended, um, they have him in custody. And now the people are trying to find out who these disciples are. And now the people are asking Judas, yeah, are you the, I, I thought you're the guy that was um, with Jesus back on, uh, in these movements. He's like, no, I don't even know what you're talking about too tough. That's number one, that's right one. Um, then in chapter 71, it goes on to say, and when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that where there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. And in 72 he says, and again he denied with an oath, I do not know that man. And you know what that oath is in modern day time? It's mum's life, I don't know my man. And what that, what that is, is basically saying, I, I'm putting my stamp of approval, you cannot hold me to this. Do you know what I mean? You have saw me with your eyes, but like no one else has. And I'm not gonna now stand here and suffer the same same thing that Jesus is gonna suffer. And this is with an oath, and with an oath is a big thing. And going into chapters, um, going into verse 73. And after a while came unto him, they that stood by and said to Peter, surely thou art one of them, for thou be wrath thee. Going on to 74. Then began, then began him to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. He even started to swear to say, yo, you're getting on my nerves now. I've told you one time, I don't know this man. Not even, not even Jesus Christ. I don't know this man, imagine. I don't know this man, someone that you've seen the greatness to now deny him swearing, saying that you, have, you don't know this man. And then the prophecy has now come through. What Jesus has said will happen, the cock will crow um, on the third time, the cock then crew. Um, and then you just imagine, imagine his guilt, because we know his guilt took him further in the chapters to take his life. But even as Christians, for us to worship, to pray, to um, sing, to sing countless songs, to go to church, if some people go three, four times a week, to do all of that, but then when the time comes to it, are you ready to be stoned? Are you ready to be killed? Are you ready to be tortured? Are you ready to suffer the same punishment that Jesus is suffering in the name of Jesus? And that's a, that's a hard question. And I'll, and I'll never ask someone to give me a reply because that is very personal. Because I, I do believe that like in that situation, you kind of see man's true colors. Do you know what I mean? You kind of really understand what's, what a man is really about. And th that's the difference between um, that's, that's generally the difference between someone with conviction and someone without. Someone with conviction is able to die with what they believe in. 
someone with conviction wavers in the wind. Um, and that was that was quite a big thing, um, especially when thinking about uh, why Jesus was betrayed in the first place. Even just a kiss on the cheek for him to be apprehended just to goes to show that no matter what, God's word will be fulfilled. Um, so it was just it was just interesting how he was betrayed by one of his best friends, and that's what, a really really key moment. So after that, God is taken before so many people. He's taken before the council of Jews. He's taken before the king, the Pharaoh at the time. Um, he's just taken for judgment. And all of these people are saying, we know Jesus to be at fault here, to be the one that's pe that is preaching the wrong doctrines. And they all know, they've seen his miracles. They know that he is not the bad guy. So imagine this, being, being the person that is being so helpful, that is... Um, miracles upon miracles that is feeding the poor that is that is assisting the widows that is transforming people's lives and now because of political agendas they now pull him down and it's quite scary because even in today's society when you try to do good there's so much corruption and i feel like this is so beautiful because again it's timeless no matter what time you're in there is going to be politics there's going to be groups of people whose agendas are evil. And what God, I believe God is trying to teach us here is that in the midst of evil, in the midst of all of these bad things that are going on, you must try your best to remain righteous, which is why I spoke about the, um, Judas, right? Because in the midst of all of these tribulations as Christians, we need to stand firm. If there's a time, this is probably the best time than ever to stand firm in your religion because so, there's so many things that will persuade you like for example power money prestige all of these things not let alone death and actually death is more of the severe one because being being persuaded by death punishment torture that is very different from money and so we're even lucky in that regard but just imagine so many things that can make us be swayed and i believe as christians especially in this time of reflection it's the perfect time to reinforce ourselves, to reignite ourselves with that conviction, to be able to say that I'm ready to suffer the consequences for being a follower of Christ. Because my rewards are ones that you can't even comprehend. So, getting into the final word. So, after he's taken into trial, after he's gone through all of these processes where people are lying on his name, saying that he's a false messenger, that he claims to be the son of God, um, they're saying that that's blasphemy and all of these things there. Um, he's just taken it in stride and he's now taken up uh, to carry his cross to his death. Imagine now, not only are they killing you for something you didn't do, they're making you carry the tool that is going to kill you to your death. Just to show you that in all of humanity, crucifixion is known to be the worst way to die because you are not it's not just a quick death, you're being tortured, you're out there in the sun, you're out there starving, dehydrated. These are all things that they did to Jesus, as well as nailing his hands um, into the cross. So he's up there, ready to, um, ready to fulfill God's word. And we're gonna go through the last uh, seven words of Christ. So these are the last things that uh, Jesus Christ said before the, um, the word was fulfilled. So, starting with number one. The first word comes from the book of Luke, chapter three, verse 34. It says, then, Je then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. So they were throwing stuff at him. They were ripping his clothes off. They're throwing bricks, they're throwing that. And he's saying, God, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Imagine as a father to a son, you saw someone doing that to your son. Do you know what I mean? How would you feel? It's it's almost unspeakable about about what these people are doing to them. What what these people are doing to Jesus, given that he's innocent as well. So this is what he said. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. This just goes to show how much Jesus loves man. Just to show how much Jesus loves these people that they are blinded by politics. They are blinded by agenda. They're blinded by all of the people that are saying, oh yeah, if you say that Jesus is wrong, we'll give you um, tax free for a year. Or all of these incentives just to, just to blind you 
or just to show that we are right and Jesus is wrong. He's saying, forgive all of them guys for they know not what they, for, for they know not what they do. His second word comes from the book of Luke, chapter 23, verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. There was, one, there was two people with him, both there for crucifixion. Um, one chose to repent, one chose not to repent. And these are the words he said unto him. He said that, I say unto thee, today shall thou be with me in paradise. So that just goes to show that this person could have been doing so much wrong in his life. And up until that very moment where he repented and he declared Christ as his Lord and Savior, at that very last moment, he said that he'll be joined with Jesus in paradise. That gives us so much hope that no matter what, I pray that God gives us the grace to make it to our, to our, to our old age where we're able to still, still have that conscious mind to ask God for forgiveness and repent. That in that last moment that you, that you may still be alive, you can ask for forgiveness and then God will forgive you of your sins. But that's only with true repentance. Then the third word from Jesus comes from the a book of John, chapter 19, verses 26 to 27. And it reads, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he said unto the mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he said unto the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that the disciple took unto her his own home. So now he's just, he's there on the cross, he's looking around, um, he probably has no energy left and he sees his disciples, he sees um, his mother Mary and as you imagine, imagine growing up with these people, imagine grow up, growing up preaching around with disciples and his mum who nurtured him and just imagine that sense of, of love at that moment where you'd say these are two, these are people that I love. He loves everybody but two specifically people that I grew up with and he was like, okay, be, this is beautiful. These are now my brothers, which is why we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, in my, in my opinion, right? These are my brothers. This is my mother. We're all together. We're all one. I want to now declare it to you guys that, listen, this is your mum. Mum, this is your son. Treat each other as such. This is the teaching that I've been, that I've been trying to preach all this time. He's been trying to teach us to love one another. And... What more love is there between a parent and a child? But then now this parent has lost one child, Jesus, and adopted how many more? So it just goes to show that even in Jesus's last moments, his love always reigns supreme. And it can be seen just by that little transaction of saying, Mary, these are your sons. Sons, these are your mum. So I thought that was very, very beautiful for, um, for Jesus to add in one of his last words. And the fourth word of Christ comes from the book of Mark, chapter 15, verse 34, and it reads, And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Elohi, Elohi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, which is being interpreted as, My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? It's... it's the pain that Jesus must be going through, right, is, words can't even describe, right? I'm thinking when I had my toothache, right, I said, this to I had to take my tooth out. This toothache, I said, I don't think there's a pain more severe than this pain. And the way that I kind of just closed my eyes and said, ah, as he's pulling it out, I'm thinking, ah, let it be done, let it be finished. This is exactly, not even exactly, this is probably a fraction of what I believe Jesus was feeling when he was saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why, why, rah. I, I think that's that's enough said, right, for um, the full word because I don't think words could actually comprehend what Jesus probably was feeling at this moment in time for him to, even knowing that this is God's will, still feel like he was forsaken because of the pain. So moving on to the fifth word, which is from the book of John. John chapter 19, verse 28, and it reads, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. 
So at this very last hour, knowing everything that was going to happen, he said that even the key word here is scripture might be fulfilled. So knowing that there is still room for God to now say, Jesus, I'm going to pardon you. Because that's where it's saying it might be fulfilled. It's not yet fulfilled, but there might be a little hope that that Jesus might have, that God might just come and change something or that something might just miraculously, ha miraculously happen. I'm sure at that point in time, Jesus would want that. But I think he's come to terms with, okay, I've made it through that pain. And I'm starting to understand that, that once that pain subsides, it is literally almost done. So that is Jesus' fifth word at that time. Coming to his sixth and almost his last word. The sixth word comes from the book of John, chapter 19, verse 30. And he says, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So imagine he's saying, I thirst. I thirst. Like you've tortured me, you've done everything. The pain has subsided. Imagine having, just saying, I'm thirsty. Like the pain, do you know like when you've, all your nervous, your nervous system is finished. You're now not feeling no more pain because you can't even comprehend it anymore. Can't comprehend pain. You're just like, okay, I, I think I'm thirsty. And that thirst might not even be a physical thirst. It might just be his body telling him something, but he might interpret it as thirst. And he was like, okay, I'm thirsty. Um, and they gave him vinegar as well, just to put extra salt on a wound. And then as they did that, he said, it is finished. I think he did understood that it might not have been the physical first that we we're thinking, but a spiritual first. And I feel like he's literally, that. that is the very last thing, which is it's finished. Head was up, bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And his last and final word, um, which is his seventh word for today. It comes from the book of Luke, chapter 23, verses 45 to 46. And 45 reads, And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thine hands I command my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. So I've heard this a lot. People say like in the final moments, you see your life flash before your eyes. I believe a similar sort of thing happened here where you, but it happened differently for Jesus because he had the clarity of the Holy Spirit with him. He had the clarity, he had the knowledge. So he was able to see God's plan, not just his life, but he's able to see God's plan. And knowing that that plan has been fulfilled, he said, Onto your hands I command my spirit. Those were his final words. Um, and I pray that th these words are encouragement, that these words are revitalized, and that knowing that in this this day, the day 39, that his soul went <laughs> his soul went to rest for a such a great purpose, for a purpose that transcends whatever whatever situation you're in, a purpose that transcends whatever depression, whatever anxiety, whatever wrongdoings you have done, except blasphemy, but whatever wrongdoings you have done, that this final day, it has superseded all of that. It has atoned for all of that that on this day that the blood of the most sacred lamb has been shed for you and I. And I pray that in you guys hearing this, you're able to just get a better understanding of what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be a follower of Christ. That really and truly in these, in these difficult times that we don't falter like Judas, that we don't now stray away from Jesus's word because life is tough that we use Jesus Christ's sacrifice as a connection, as a bridge between us and God. Thank you and God bless. Thank you for tuning in to day 39 of our Lent 102 series. 
please be sure to follow us on all our social media platforms at Morningstar London, where we'll be uploading daily content to assist you on your Lenten journey.